payment services from banks, money transmitters, um, but also in the digital asset space. Uh, custodians, exchanges, wallet providers, um, counseling them on money transmitter issues, uh, consumer compliance, securities, anti-money laundering, kind of run the gamut. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, happy to help you. If you have any questions, I'll be around for the event. Uh, but otherwise, I thanks to the speakers and uh, watch you if I will. Guys, so uh, just a quick background on blockchain for women. How many of you guys have been to one of our events before? Okay, some of you, great. So I'll be quick. So we started a couple of years ago, and um, the focus of our group is to increase diversity, but also focus on and delve into specific blockchain topics like the one we're talking about today. Um, if you come to our website and you're interested in learning more about the other blockchain use cases, are out there. We've had a lot of panels with many um, very um, experienced and talented people talking about different blockchain use cases. So I encourage you to go to our website and, and check out the sessions. Um, so before we get started, just want to do a quick level set on stable coins and, and why we're here today. So for those of you who are new to stable coins, um, stable coins are effectively digital assets. Um, that are backed by something, and that something could be fiat, could be commodity, so fiat would be USD, euro, and so forth. Commodity could be any kind of precious metal, you know, like gold. Um, uh, stable coins could also be pack, backed by other cryptocurrency, and there's also stable currency, uh, stable coins that are not backed by any collateral, um, but are, are managed by algorithms. So. That's kind of the quick overview of, of what stable coins are. Um, now, what we'll go into this panel today is the use cases, why stable coins are around, um, what each of these um, within the, in the companies they offer um, have in terms of stable coins. So, while we go into that, I'll just let you guys go down the line, talk about your backgrounds, how you got into this space, and what your companies offer in terms of stable coins. Sure, why not? <laughs> Um, hi everyone, I'm Miranda Ma from OKCoin USA. So um, I started as a capital markets lawyer um, back practicing in Asia and uh, did a little bit of investment banking back in London and finally landed here in the area. So it's kind of inevitable for all kind of um, um, capital markets lawyer who interested in what's happening, the latest in the industry to tumble into crypto. Um, yeah, so I joined OKCoin um, USA office um, back in 2018. So I was employee number, I think, 12. And now we have 45, uh, sorry, 35 people in our San Francisco office. And we have a larger presentation in Asia um, and also in Europe. We have office in Malta. Um, OKCoin is a crypto fiat uh, exchange. Um, and uh, if you haven't heard about it, uh, welcome to try it out. It's amazing. <laughs> is, is the volume okay? Can the people yeah, in the back? Good. Okay, great. Um, I'm Haley Lennon with Coinbase. I'm regulatory counsel there. Um, I've been in the space for about six years. Started at Silvergate Bank, which is a major banking partner in the space. Um, Coinbase was actually one of the first clients I worked with at Silvergate back in the day. Um, then I spent two years at Bitflyer, which is an international virtual currency exchange out of Tokyo, Japan, where I helped with their U.S. expansion and getting the, um, their licenses, including the Bit license here in the U.S. And now I'm at Coinbase, so I've been there about three months. So it's still a pretty new venture for me, but my role is really interacting with all the regular regulators that touch this space. The, um, uh, we have a trust charter in New York, so working with New York EFS is a big part of my role, talking to regulators about projects like the stable coins is a big part of my role, so um, I think we're going to get into like what our businesses are involved in in the stable coin world, but I, I'm really excited about this part of my role, so I just to talk about it. Hi everyone, my name is Sochi Cazador, and I work at C Labs, where I work in the Cello platform. Uh, Cello's mission is to build an open financial system that creates prosperity for all. Um, this is a mission that I personally care deeply for. My grandparents and my parents were Mexican migrant farmers, so I've seen firsthand how access to basic financial tools can change lives, and I'm excited to talk to you about that here today. 
That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I stand by that too. Um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Catherine Coley. I run Binance US here in San Francisco. We are a uh, easy, convenient way for you to buy and sell cryptocurrencies with your dollars. So we list about 29 coins uh, with 50 trading pairs um, and are uh, the US partner to uh, the larger ecosystem of so Binance. Um, Binance currently facilitates uh, a global ecosystem truly of uh, exchanges as well as um, different counterparts that you can So they internationally have uh, margin lending, um, you know, all, all sorts of features, and we've just begun our journey here in the United States uh, to be able to launch exactly what Americans need. Uh, so we're keenly listening to what you are craving to have built, um, and we're building for you. So uh, we're got a small team. I've got one of my teammates here, Josh, in the corner, a big supporter of us all. So um, appreciate all the questions, feel your answers, and uh, we'll get off on the table. So um, quick. Just before we go into the panel, I'm Karen. So by day, I'm a I'm the CEO of Blockchain Intel, and we do blockchain analytics. Our first use case is fraud, and we help identify the bad guys. So that's for financial companies, exchanges like the ladies are um, the, the exchanges that are here, and also um, we work with law enforcement. And uh, Katya over here is also with Blockchain Intel. So if you have any questions for us, um, please come up. Now, the first thing we want to just go into is what does each of your companies do in terms of stable coins? I mean, what stable coins do you list, or what stable coins does your exchange or your company have? And then you could go into the differentiation as to, you know, why it's better. <laughs> That's good too. I thought this is a safe spot, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, um, OKCoin, okay in the uh, stablecoin side, OKCoin okay does two things. Uh, one thing is uh, because we are a fiat crypto exchange, uh, we list those major uh, stablecoins, um, like including USDC, uh, TrueUSD, Tether, of course, um, and um, like Paxos. And uh, on another side, we also launched our own stablecoin called USDK. Um, uh, outside of U.S. though, so that's to facilitate our international, like across platform uh, trans uh, transactions, um, and um, that's mainly like how we evolved in the uh, stablecoin space. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Coinbase is involved in two major projects when it comes to stablecoins. The first is USDC. So USDC is a project that we launched in conjunction with Circle and form the center network. So the center network is the administrator audit level um, network for USDC. USDC is a stable coin pegged to one, one to one to the dollar. Um, and it is currently sort of the, uh, it is the largest regulated stable coin, I would say. And I can get into that sort of differentiation later, but, um, but it's been around a long time, and um, right now it has about 450 million market cap, so it's very uh, large and, and used. The second is that we're also in the Libra Association, so for people in the room who may not be as familiar with cryptocurrency, Facebook sort of put crypto and stable coins in the, in the spotlight when they announced their intentions to form the Libra Association. So we've been a founding member from the beginning. Um, there are differences between USDC and the stable coin that Libra is looking to make, and we can get more in detail on that too later in the panel. But um, but those are the two projects that I'm working on. This. So at Celo, our unique approach is that we believe that anybody that participates in governance can actually propose a new currency. We're actually starting with uh, the Celo dollar. Um, Celo dollar is. Um, it's a stable currency that is pegged to the U.S. dollar, but we foresee uh, launching other currencies as we um, as we go to market uh, um, uh, in the next few months. Um, the one thing that I'll say as well is that um, we have a stability protocol that basically adjusts the, um, the the supply of the stable coin based on the demand. So it is um, an algorithm based um, based stable coin. Uh, I kind of see stable coins in, in a a helpful and hurtful way for this ecosystem. So when stable coins kind of came out, it was very anti what I thought we were building Bitcoin and the ecosystem itself of. It was supposed to be non-government backed, it was supposed to be beyond that. Um, so when stable coins kind of came through, it 
was this comfort of like sigh, at least it's dollar back, um, which gave a lot more, uh, as the pie got larger in terms of people that felt comfortable around digital assets. The other great thing about stable coins is that in a highly volatile world, such as digital assets, it's stable. So <laughs> you can still have, uh, I kind of use the analogy of if you're on the super highway of digital assets, you can pull over on the shoulder to be on a stable coin, but if you're going to go into fiat, you got to take the exit ramp. So you can still stay on the course of remaining in a digital ecosystem while using a you know, stable coin. And that allows for when trading is successful, if you want to pull yourself out of a trade, if you want to take profits, but you don't necessarily want to be going fiat, not fiat, fiat, not fiat. So that's where I saw it as a huge helper. It also let people who were afraid to buy something early on take something as easy as moving regular US dollars into something that was a digital dollar or a stable coin. So um, with Binance US, we offer every trading pair that we list with US dollars, the token itself, and then a USDT pair or a BUSD pair. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit later on BUSD. But the real purpose was that to allow people not to feel like they had to be one foot in crypto, one foot out every time they wanted to put their brakes on, but they could stay within the ecosystem of being in a digital asset environment. So um, that's what I really like about stable coins. Although I'm always, you know, why do you got to be out of the system, stay, stay in the game? Um, but the the efforts that we have at Binance US, we include uh, USDT uh, and then BUSD. And BUSD was launched to bridge the Binance ecosystems uh, with a dollar backed coin. It's run by Paxos. Uh, it's New York DFS approved. Um, and it's actually listed on 43 other exchanges. So it's not just Binance's ecosystem, but it, it, it interacts with it. So that's it. it was a huge beginning to see um, that ability to have something or pairs based in local exchanges that have the same uh, source or denomination as the US. That's where we see it being a benefactor for folks that want to move currencies around the world quickly, um, want to have kind of a, a consistent approach to where they're going. Um, but also the ability to stay uh, with the benefits. You get uh, you know, great yield on BUSD. There's a complimentary system for on the international exchanges for putting collateral. You can put a collateral in BUSD um, for futures. And um, so there's some great feature sets more for the international, just because in the US, uh, we're just getting started. Okay, good. So for those who are new to stable coins, one of the big issues that stable coins help address like, uh, Colin, you're starting to bring up for is volatility and how the cryptocurrencies, extremely volatile stable coins, address some of that. Now, if um, you could go into this a little bit more, Bailey, just what is the landscape right now um, in terms of stable coins and you know, what what roles in terms of projects you're talking about and your involvement with, with that? Do those concerns um, uh, and how are those concerns addressed? Yeah. Yeah, so we were sort of preparing for the panel, and I said that one way that when I joined Coinbase and we obviously have so much, many other things that have regulatory implications, really how I wrap my head around the stable coin area is making um, bucketing stable coins into certain categories. So the way I think about it uh, and the way we discuss it internally at Coinbase is there's really sort of three buckets of stable coins. The first would be a stable coin backed by a basket of assets. So uh, the Libra Association, for example, Libra is backed by 50% USD, but the other 50% is a mix of other sovereign currencies. And one of the things that started to sort of alarm policymakers and regulators in the US when uh, the Libra so Association announced this idea is that that starts to play into sort of monetary policy. If the Libra Association is able to determine how the percentages of different currencies are built within that, that basket of assets. Um, that's sort of um, undermining the US dollar and uh, giving monetary policy to a private company. And so that was really the way, the way that we think about how we can be part of that association and help is being part of that conversation and seeing if there's another way to really uh, form that stable coin in a way that isn't so sort of alarming or um, gets the regulators uh, having so many questions. Um, so that's sort of how I first think of the first bucket of a basket of assets. And that's, that's not just Libra, other stable 
coins are using sort of um, a mixture of different, you said commodities, commodities and a combination of, of different currencies. Um, the second type of stable coin would really be able to be backed by cryptocurrency itself. And to me, it's a bit ironic because the idea of a stable coin is for it to be stable. Cryptocurrencies are often volatile. So if you are uh, back, you know, pegging a stable coin to cryptocurrency, that is going to require a lot more sort of oversight um, and action to help keep that stability of the stable coin. And so that requires, um, you know, it requires sort of the uh, looking over the volatility and, and also even trade activity to help with that. And the concern there is if you are um, doing action to dictate the price and limit the stability, it starts to, I'll say, have the appearance of manipulation. You, know, you are you are manipulating the price and how do you make that so it's not market manipulation in the bad the bad word or, or a way in which that you could um, you know actually sort of get in trouble for it. And then the third basket and I think will be the focus of more of the panel is um, is stable coins backed by one currency, specifically in the US, often USD. Um, there are other um, projects including tether that are are similar in in certain ways but in others they are um, more offshore and more unregulated and that ends up being um, sort of the the downfall and in individuals always being able to trust tether so for anyone who's not familiar tether is a stable coin but offshore and so that's made it difficult to um, for people to be confident that it's back one for one the, same, the way they say it is, it makes it harder to enforce sort of auditing, um, oversight of that stable point. Um, and it really has just turned into something where, you know, the, bank, the, the way they're relying on banks to enforce Tether, there's no FDIC insurance offshore. And so things like that make, make Tether or an offshore stable point a bit different than some of the projects we're talking about today that are USD backed stable coins in the US that are regulated, um, audited, approved by DFS and that sort of thing. So those are sort of the three categories, but um, I definitely am a bit biased about sort of the uh, USDC regulated type currency that um, we'll be talking a bit about today. So, so Catherine, given your financial background, um, do you have certain metrics or things you look at in terms of trying to find something? You know, say this is doing well, performing better, um, is more useful um, than the other one. Are, are there any ways that you evaluate the stable coin? Yeah, I, I think it's funny. My background is foreign exchange, so I was based in Hong Kong and London uh, dealing in the FX markets. Uh, and so everything for us was. Uh, you trade something always against the dollar. So to have a stable coin, that's kind of all of FX is always something against the dollar or against the euro. So we would use those uh, quote pairs, base pairs as our denominator, um, which I think is what crypto is trying to kind of get towards with stable coins. So that's like something that could be more of a denominator. Um, so in FX, we never had something against the dollar. Okay. That's the perk. Uh, you didn't really want stability. You wanted that volatility. Um, you know, that kind of market environment. But in, in how we're evaluating stable coins for a listing, especially on our platform, really comes down to uh, a lot of the functionality beyond the volume. Any coin that's listed on our platform, we run through a digital asset risk assessment framework, um, which gives us the comfort to be able to apply that for you guys. Um, we're not the gatekeepers to tell you what you can and cannot use. We simply want to be the platform that gives you that freedom to choose what you are comfortable with, what makes you know your portfolio adequate to your expectations. Um, so we really do this, um, you know, I, as we vet through the stable coins, which ones are better you better utilized and better suited for our US based community. Um, so given USDT was the largest stable coin used all over the world, we assumed that most Americans still wanted access to it, um, which is where we started off with most of our pairs based against USDT. Um, the other elements that we consider are, you know, how can we be uh, effectively sandalized? Build out of the stable coins. It's something that's important for us to just make sure that, as you mentioned, like the others in the hotline for tether is a little bit difficult. Is that a strength rather than a weakness? Um, is there a comfort in knowing um, you know, the USD isn't listed just on only Binance's platforms, but it's listed on like 43 or 40 other 
on the exchanges. Um, and so that's kind of the way money is done. The, the, the backing mechanisms to which it is one to one purely, are we confident in that? Is it regulated? Um, is, it, uh, is it useful? Is it trading? Um, and is it you know, easy to redeem and mint uh, at the same function? That's a, that mechanism is oftentimes one that's either used by the market or misunderstood. So we have to make sure that that mechanism is as functional for users that want uh, to be putting in a you know, large amount of dollars into the system to trade Bitcoin and others and take it off. Do they have enough liquidity to, to put it in? So let's drill into the usefulness aspect a little bit. And so, Soshi, if you could talk about the use cases, and I know Cello is new, but given your background, given what Cello's mission is, um, what are the use cases for stable coins, and, and what do you think the promise is? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, Sea Labs has done extensive field research in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And I'd like to start with a story. So, I actually led a research trip to Oaxaca. Where I had the opportunity to meet Rosa. Um, Rosa's husband was away working in the U.S. and um, basically she needed cash to pay for her mother's hospital bills. So at the time she needed it most, her husband sent money but accidentally sent it to a village with the same name in a different state. And she wasn't able to access it. She had to wait a week in order for this to be corrected so that she could actually get money to pay for her mother's health condition. Now think about that. If we're talking about the use of Bitcoin or Ethereum, which are great tools, waiting a week, there would be a lot of volatility, right? So I think the promise of having a stable coin is that it offers more stability and takes a lot of the risk away from, um, away from the, the users. Um, some of the other use cases that I'm really excited about, again, I'll, I'll um, focus on Mexico because that's the market, um, was talking to some coffee farmers in the state of Chiapas, um, and they're actually using stable coins to issue agriculture loans. And this use case is a little bit different, right? So like Chiapas, um, the villages are very remote. We're talking about populations of less than 100 um, that are very difficult to access. Traditionally, how loans are distributed to them is basically by putting money in a car and taking them to these people. And so I think, again, the promise of having a digital currency and a stable coin addresses some of the safety concerns, um, as well as just being able to have that uh, uh, less, less risk. Uh, and there are a number of other use cases that we've seen as well. So um, one of the ones that I'm excited about, we talk a lot about financial inclusion, it's having access to financial tools and products, but what about access to money and the ability to actually earn? Um, so there's a project in Brazil called Love Crypto that basically enables micro earnings for people in favelas to earn um, stable coins. And I think these are examples of just how we're giving access to people that traditionally don't have access. And I think the promise for me is that we're being more inclusive, we're bringing more people in, and we're democratizing it all. Um, one thing I'd add is that that narrative is so moving to me too, and there's you know a lot of conversations about things that are happening in Venezuela and um, just refugees in general that are um, stories coming out of people actually using stable coins or bitcoins, you know, uh, on zip drives and and bringing those with them as a way to carry a large amount of wealth with them uh, that the government cannot confiscate or devalue. And um, sometimes the volatility is a good thing. If you if you leave and ten days later you check your balance and you have a lot more money, that's great. But when you need that stability, stable coins come into play. Yeah, we actually our entire company went um, to Colombia to meet with Venezuelan refugees. And just for those of you that may not have access to it, like their currency basically they have more value by creating like ornaments and art and selling that on the street than their actual currency. So. Even um, having access to Bitcoin or Ethereum is a huge plus for them. And imagine taking that further with having a stable currency. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I'll add, I don't know if anyone else has anything on use case, but um, USTC actually, the, the stable coin we have at Coinbase, was just a few months ago announced in Bermuda that the Bermudan government now will accept it for tax payments or any other government sort of payments. So. We found that very interesting to see a government agency willing to use that currency as a form of payment. And a part of it is the 
um, you know, all the companies up here are regulated and well, well thought of, and I think that they trust that sort of stability and want to give their residents another way of making payments, um, and, and they can then redeem those, those you know, USDCs for, for dollars whenever they choose. You have a survey kind of in the room, though. Um, how, how many people hands raised? I'll close my eyes. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, seeing stable coins as a method for payment. Yeah. That's more than I thought. Um, that that cycle, like life cycle of fiat in crypto write up uh, or take profit stable coin payment. Is one that I keep hearing specifically to the U.S. Uh, market. In Asia and other locations, it's a purely speculative game. So why would you need to take money out of the system and you go know, pay for things? That was kind of your, your allotted amount that you're providing that on, on, on the profit. So for the U.S., though, I keep seeing people want to increase that functionality for payments. Um, and stable coins allow it to be not as much of a tax burden for you. So that's something that's interesting that we just see more and more coming out with um, using BitPay launching several other stable coins and then using Bitcoin. Um, because it, you're putting you know fiat in to earn you know, 2% on your certain stable coin, that's great. Then you can use that for your donations, and it's a lot better of a system than say your checking account. Um, so I think that's an interesting play on this digital economy that's not even in the speculative world of oh, Yeah, it was um, just to add on to that from a payments perspective, it was really interesting again going to Latin America. There are convenience stores that sort of act as um, kind of pseudo banking institutions. And so, in order to buy something on Amazon, if you don't have access to a bank account, you actually run down to the local 7 Eleven to pay in person uh, so that this payment in states is also like, very powerful. Just to add on to that, we talked about real world like uh, payments uh, methods for uh, stable coin. And also, coming back to the crypto world, I think also another use case for stable coin is an excellent like alternative for on ramp off ramp for fiat channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of people, especially for like elderly, who is not that um, advanced in uh, technology side, actually stable coin is a great like gateway for them to get hooked up in the crypto world. And once you get on the stable coin train, then you can like more freely to trade into other tokens. And I see that uh, is definitely a new feature and a great function for stable coin. Exactly. <laughs> Get you addicted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it will help you get your collateral faster. So, yeah. yeah. Rather than sending a wire or just a machine or something like that, so that it's a safer and more uh, valued. It's interesting too, Crypto Dad, the former CFTC, who is now creating this sort of like digitized dollar um, think tank sort of thing. So I think that we're going to start seeing more movement in the US just about like exploring potential because with some of these projects at first you just need that sort of think tank and bouncing ideas around and who knows what will happen. I guess I've been in crypto about three years. Three years essentially, but Jen still asks this question. Is uh, well, what do you think about Fed coin? Fed coin is going to stable coin. So, I mean, I think the, the use case of a stable coin or something that's valid access to money would resonate a lot better with people than, per se, the initial peer-to-peer -peer network that's promised with Bitcoin. So, as a cheerleader of all people, all, all aspects of getting the understanding, stable coins have done wonders, even like the Libra uh, association, just getting. Unusual factors of digital money into more digestible terms for people. Super helpful for these type of systems. Um, any way that you can connect with someone where they get the light bulb effect is going to be really nice. Uh, uh, so, not to call out, we do have someone. We do have someone from the head here. If you. <laughs> <laughs> My first um, event. 
discussion afterwards about Bitcoin. Um, but uh, and so thank you guys for talking about on ramps and um, and the role of stablecoin as on ramps. We'll get to the question about um, central banks a little bit later. Um, I did want to spend a little bit of time on the challenges that stablecoins face, in particular in light of you know some of the market manipulation that you talked about, Haley, and some of the other anti-money laundering you know issues that not only the cryptocurrency face, uh, cryptocurrency industry face, but also the financial industry in general. Um, but we've been working on a case where there has been a lender that you know looks like they might have manipulated the market to basically depress a coin's price, and as a result, take all the collateral from the borrowers. And it's not as difficult as you would think, um, obviously happening in a lot of other markets, but um, if Marina, you could talk about, uh, especially since the light of the work that you've been doing um, in the regulatory space, and I know all of you have um, been touching in this area. So we'll start with Miranda and then, and then go um, to the others about your experiences in, in dealing with these kinds of um, issues where you're trying to find bad guys or working with the regulators to find the bad guys. Sure. So, okay. like, we talk about how good stablecoin is, right, and all those use cases, and the the part part of the reason why stablecoin is amazing because it's so like money that you can use and it's so stable and it so it can be used as an exchange medium because it's so like money. So in regulators' eyes, like, why why not we're regulating it as a currency? That's a big question out there, and um, and like. Probably in U.S., uh, we don't see much. If we like, like jump out of the box of U.S. and take a look at what's happening globally, if you look at Europe, especially like uh, in U.K. and in Malta, uh, there are like uh, e-money e laws, and re which require a different license for you to like if you want to like operate or issue a uh, stablecoin. And uh, you probably heard about the uh, stablecoins um, euros. Uh, issued by stasis and um, and there are helping a lot of discussion about um, what's the difference between uh, electronic money and a real currency and why not we are regulating it differently and there is a higher much higher scrutiny on a real currency circulating than stablecoin um, as of today um, so especially for from the anti-money anti -money laundering perspective um, like uh, we need to break down to different roles of uh, big players playing in the stablecoin uh, ecosystem. Who is the issuer? Who is the administrator? Who has been like really dominating or kind of issuing the token who is in circulating, right? If we're talking about those centralized uh, stablecoins like Tether, like USDC, the reason why, take one step back, the reason why we kind of trust more on the let's say USDC, those centralized ones, because we know the issuer is a regulated entity, probably holds some like certain status uh, in certain jurisdictions, hopefully in US. So when we come in back to US, whether it is uh, money, um, MSB, money services business, and uh, whether it has been registered on different state level, gets all those registration down, that's a big factor like when you evaluate whether a token is properly, like heavily regulated or not, and that boosts the trust. So um, I think a lot of the challenges actually, in my view, in 2020, um, a lot of challenges go arising on the regulatory side on those decentralized uh, tokens, uh, decentralized uh, stable coins. Um, backed by algorithm, there is no, there is no like we, so we call it issuer or centralized administrator to those tokens. How do you define their obligation on the ALL KYC card? Uh, do they also have to do like um, like register with Fencen as a MSB or not? And also on the state level, if they need to do all the registrations, um, what should they do? Uh, there is a big question mark on those type of decentralized um, uh, stablecoins. Uh, and also, I think the uh, ongoing lawsuit against the uh, tether also draw a lot of attention on how you, like how uh, even a fiat backed stablecoin uh, works uh, in these days. 
um, and um, and and um, I'm my my personal interest is also like trying to see like how the tether suitcase will like lawsuit will like play out. Um, so a lot of things like uh, a lot of exciting things happening for sure in the space, and uh, we'll see how it will ride out in the next uh, like one two years. Um, yeah, so as, as the issuer and, and we missed USDC, I mean, I think what you, what you said makes a lot of sense. It's the focus on still being a regulated entity that understands, you know, know your customer, does the anti-mine laundering um, program. The one topic that I, that we found pretty interesting, and I can only speak so much to this, but is the topic of black, uh, blacklisting or, you know, SDN, SDN list or counter terrorist organizations, for those of you not familiar. Um, so under, through OFAC, we're required to ensure that we're not facilitating transactions on behalf of anyone on the SDN list. That's a, that's a given. But all of the uh, stable coins in the U.S. that are sort of right, are, are regulated, are approved by New York DFS. They have blacklisting capabilities. Um, that's sort of part of what makes them what they are. And but that turns into a there's a gray area of how many, what other people should you be blacklisting? What other organizations? And we've been having really interesting conversations at Coinbase with you know uh, members of the government, and and there seems to be really an understanding. And I would say. Um, in terms of regulation, like a flexibility in their understanding of your balancing two things. You need to regulate, you need to know who your customer is, you don't want to be facilitating terrorist activity or money laundering, but it needs to be a functional coin. It needs to do what it's meant to do, which is uh, facilitate payments potentially or be a store of value. Um, and so, you know, we've talked to many states, it's clear that states view stable coins as, uh, and, and issuing them as money transmission, so getting money transmitter laws in every state. Um, for, the, for anyone really interested in this topic, uh, last April, Texas came out with a, with a pretty interesting memo that actually speaks to this and how they view stable coins as money transmission and how that works. So that was, I have it written down, memo. 1037, if anyone, <laughs> if there's any attorneys in the room that are interested. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think what you're talking about, all the all the topics of money laundering, money transmitter laws, capital requirements, those all start to come into play when you're talking about stable money. Just a quick add-on, um, like for, so it's very interesting to see that Fenson uh, I think one of their director came out earlier last year um, saying, especially I think it's a big shout out to those decentralized uh, stablecoin uh, program, um, is saying like all the, I think the stablecoin administrators should be registered as MSB, like no exception. So that's a, a interesting turning point um, for a regulator came out and shouted out so clearly. Uh, and um, well, uh, let's see how, Unfold in 2020, and uh, how many of those uh, stablecoin issuers or administrators will go ahead and do the registration with Finson? And just for anyone who's not as familiar with, with this topic, so Finson oversees the uh, Bank Secrecy Act, which requires anti money laundering programs. So since 2013, 2013 is when Finson said, hey, if you're an exchanger or an administrator of cryptocurrency, you need to be registered. If you're just a user and you just come to Coinbase and buy some, you don't have to register as an MSB and have an anti-money laundering program. Since then, Finson sort of continues to say, oh, and if you're an ICO issuer, you need to be an MSB and know who your customers are. Oh, if you issue stable coins. So, um, you know, they've been pretty proactive and in a good way in sort of adding uh, clarification on who else within this ecosystem would be considered a money services business and we have an AML program. Um, but that's just sort of background. So now that we have over 200 stable coins, the central banks around the world are also coming to issue their own coins. So uh, when I talk to the World Economic Forum, they say there are definitely like five or six central banks that are 
on it right now. They've got their own coins out or they're in pilots and they're you know, going to the market with these coins. So the question for you guys is, so what do you think the other central banks are gonna do? Um, and what do you think is healthy? Also, huge validation of the market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's funny, I um, part of the running Binance US was at Ripple, and they hosted a central bank summit um, at the end of either early 2018 or end of 2017. Um, and it was 30 central bankers um, in a room doing a show and tell of what they've been working on. And the consensus of that group was. Thank you so much, but why would we need a digital coin in our corners? And a lot of the times we think of that in a similar case of the US dollar inside of the United States is you know Arkansas and Arizona don't need a an FX rate in order to do business. So why would Canada from Montreal and Toronto or Vancouver need a digital currency for their own? And the, the bigger thing that we have to remember and we reminded them the central bankers that like holds them off, is this is not about you inside of your closed wall. This is about access for international trade, for um, you know, freedom of money to be moving outside your borders as well as within your borders for a purpose. So once they realize that you know the proof of concept they were thinking about within their own you know, guidelines of how is this going to be functional for the United States to be the United States within the United States or another bank, uh, I mean another central bank, they got the idea that this was far larger than what they were expecting. So I think. Crypto has caught on to that earlier, realizing the benefit of uh, a system that is inclusive and, and large at that scale. Um, and central banks are just now beginning to catch on to realize that this isn't to fix their own ACH or SEPA or um, you know internal payment system issues. This is for a larger, broader sense of how um, their currency can be perceived uh, at the local So that is that is a shift that we're seeing. Definitely, central banks are seeing the benefits to this. You see um, people really keenly preparing for how this will be commercial, and they've taken off that almost um, naivete of, of realizing it was only for their own borders or only their own borders. So I think that's huge. So I recently traveled back to China. Um, not too recently, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I think if, if ever you travel to the, like in Asia, especially China these days, you'll find out like it's super convenient to just use WeChat Pay or um, Pay these days to buy things without even using RMB. So and with that being said, so when the news came out saying the Chinese government is like hurrying up, like roll roll up their leaders, leaves on um, getting the electronic RMB coming out of the way, like. It is no surprise, like in China, because like from the infrastructure level, I think China has been so ready in all different ways to kind of hurry up and roll out this thing. Um, I think among the whole uh, picture, actually Libra is a like huge like um, um, I don't know trigger in in the great uh, government effort. So, so circling back to the I think what the Koli just said and also what uh, Haley just said. I think the, the stable coin actually is a great trigger for all the central governments to realize that the sovereignty like um, like currency is is under great competition now, and they better hurry up and throw out something more convenient, more useful in a larger scale, um, and uh, to hurry up. Um, but uh, I don't know, like as long as it's a central bank backed token, it has to like restrict it to a certain like geographic area, right? So I still have big faith in like a crypto flat on um, the central or like a stable coin who has more like uh, representation across different geographic areas uh, to like to leading the trend. Yeah. yeah, I always, I mean, I got into Bitcoin because I was really excited about uh, its potential to get away from the banking system and, uh, and help the unbanked. You know, there's a lot of statistics out there that um, you know, most people abroad have phones that can access exchanges, but they don't have bank accounts. So they can buy, you know, they can figure out ways to receive uh, cryptocurrency and have that where they couldn't go to a bank. Some in some countries, women can't have bank accounts, that sort of thing. 
so it gives freedom. Um, but I was excited and mixed feelings about uh, the Libra launch because I do think it, it ignited something. I think that it shows that things are going to happen and the regulators and, uh, and the companies need to be more in step with one another and talk about things. Um, and I think that what's happening in China is maybe lighting a fire for the US. And so things are happening and you don't want to be left behind. Um, our chief legal officer at Coinbase often says, no one wants to be at the party, but you also don't want to not get an invitation. So like, you don't want to be the last person that doesn't um, sort of jump on this as an opportunity and innovation. So, you know, I'm excited to see where this goes. And I agree with that. Like, this is a very big validation of 10, 11 years ago, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper saying, you know, with this idea, um, and I think people are finally catching on. So it's great. It's their own interpretation. We'll let it, we'll <laughs> let it, we'll let it happen. I, I think when stable coins did come up, I was like, oh, we've lost the whole plot. <laughs> um, but that being said, it, it's allowing people to digest it in a way that makes sense. Give us, you know, 10, 15 years from now, you'll be like, why are we backing this thing to fiat currencies? What were we thinking? Um, our whole lives are you know, borderless now, but in, in the near term, we have to adapt to what, we're, what we know best. And people have always stored their wealth either in commodities or in um, the currency of their country where they're paying taxes, where they're getting salaries. So the more we see freelance, nomad life, uh, you know, remote work, as much as that seems prevalent and more so, we also have to remember that we're in stable privilege too. As um, a lot of people still are definitely tied to their location where they live, to their jobs that are there, and the taxes and the burdens. Um, you know, their, their, their lives are still quite stable. Um, so that's where we have to remember that this is going to be an evolution of how we understand it, even if it, it doesn't make sense to everyone. So we wanted to open up just for a couple questions. I know it's getting late, so does anybody have questions? Okay. Next. If you got to be a regulator for a day, okay. what's the one thing that you would want to change for your company or your industry? Um, that's a really good question. I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, I, sometimes my frustration is when speaking to regulators or even even people outside of the industry. What always gets picked up is like the headline news, the things that, that you know, the hacks that Quad3 does, the, the times that, you know, the, that the industry hasn't functioned well. Um, and so a lot of time is spent educating about the pros because the, the negatives sort of make the headline news. So in a way, I wish that I could sort of explain that to all regulators and get it over <laughs> with for once. Um, but, you know, being in the industry for the last six years, like I really have seen the tone of, of the regulatory agencies change. Um, we have, like I said at the beginning, the New York Trust Charter uh, and the New York Bit License, and both of those are very heavy lift. <clears throat> they want, they approve every token, every new product and service. Um, and we've been talking with them about ways to uh, improve that. So I think just uh, open openness to, to change uh, would be good. Yeah. Open it to change. I totally agree. I feel like when you talk to uh, when we talk to regulators, we can definitely feel like, um, especially in crypto space, everyone's learning. The regulators are no expert, like better expert in, on those topics than us. So I think currently, especially for state regulators, they already show a uh, great eager to like to open the dialogue welcome more like uh, industry knowledge to educate them. Uh, CFTC has their lab CFTC up front and SEC is doing all the touring like meetings around the um, different nation. So I would say like, this is a great trend, but they need to open up more, like make them more accessible. Like if you guys, if, if the token project, if exchanges have something like cutting edge, um, like they can, uh, the market for participants can find a safe space to talk to the regulator and kind of probe of what's happening um, like in the regulatory path. Yeah, that will be a great change I was like looking forward to. Oh, if I'm gonna be a regulator for the day, I change the taxation of cryptocurrencies. 
Um, so right now it's treated as property. It makes things very difficult for you to conceptualize what exactly is going to be, uh, you know, capital gains, profit. Um, you know, if I'm buying this coffee, do I have to do a trico lipo, which is not going to be <laughs> for it all? Um, it's slowing down people's acceptance and understanding of it. I mean, myself included, when I learned about cryptocurrencies, it's like, great, FX, this makes sense. I know how to trade markets. Then I learned about the taxation of it, and I was like, paralyzed. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do anything that's going to get me in trouble with this. So that being the hurdle to which I was potentially able to get ahead in this financial infrastructure that we're in, uh, trade in hours that normal banking or normal markets don't allow, um, and still put me in a state of paralysis, unable to actually take action on it. Um, and sometimes it's something that slows us down. I think it's there for a reason. Um, to slow us down because uh, the evolution of crypto with the internet, with uh, the compounding globalization we're facing, we're moving faster than people that are the slowest ones in the world. So, uh, taxing us is really easy to slow us down. Uh, it's also really easy to make digital innovation really easy to slow us down. Yeah. Um, and I guess, like, what I would add is if I were a regulator for a day, I would remember that money essentially is one of the oldest forms of technology that we have. Right, and to remember that, that this is basically is a way for us to innovate and to explore how to take this to the next level to be more inclusive. So uh, that's what I'd like to see. I'm Maya, um, here to throw a curveball. So two questions. Uh, the first is a lot of folks think that 2020 is the year of regulation on stable coins, primarily because the flows that we're seeing for stable coins is mostly used to get away from capital gains or capital controls. So countries like China, countries like Russia, and countries like Brazil are the primary users of stable coins into the US um, and around the world. And when you look at that, uh, you a country doesn't get to tax um, those capital gains, for example. And so the country is losing capital on some of those things. And at what point is it going to be a big red flag for these regulators? And how difficult, so like for example, with USDC, if there's a specific organization that they can come after. With USDT, that's a little harder for the US to go after Tether. Um, so what is that having point that you think uh, where countries are going to be like, all right, we're losing a lot of money off of perhaps taxation or not being able to track monetary flow or not being able to see if there is anti-money laundering going on because um, not all companies are as great as Coinbase for tracking some of that stuff. Um, so what do you think that point is? That's my first question. And second question for Cello um, is looking specifically at the use case that you meant for Mexico for lending. Why would, if someone already has a phone um, and is connected to the internet, why not use an organization like Kiva or Blend or some of these other fintech companies that help with micropayments and microloans and microtransactions as opposed to, and the peso is not that volatile, um, as opposed to uh, like going to USDC if you're going to make that money. The first one, second one's targeted to you. Good luck. Um, uh, it is, I, I'm really only building the, within the regulations right now. So um, going through the FinCEN regulation, going through the state by state NCL process. Uh, getting the USD approved by New York PFF, um, preparing and being in that conversation with them while we progress and these fears and concerns uh, get elevated, that's the best thing to do. Um, you know, it, it's all unknown, so as long as we can keep these conversations open, show the roadmap of what we're working on and how we're going to be preparing for it, that's the best way to ensure that my users know that they're in the best protected regulatory environment. Um, so that's really how we're looking at it. Um, for, for the larger group, uh, if you can think about uh, you know, what, what has finance been done on, on this initiative in FX? Um, they've joined the board of micro OCD. FX is hugely involved from a compliance standpoint of working together with these um, you know, government regulations to make sure they're actually being implemented and move forward in progress. We all want to get somewhere next year that isn't right now where we are here. So if we can be you know, participants in that uh, evolution for regulators to get clarity on why that's hurting the industry. That's all of us are thinking about it. It's all right now. Uh, and preventing that progress is a really huge thing. Um, yeah, well, thanks for the nice words about Coinbase. I mean, we do take 
the uh, building of the stable coin industry really seriously. I think what what we feel is that the more collaboration there is here in the U.S., and then there also starts to be more discussion between regulators in the U.S. with regulators abroad, especially as companies like ours start to be in multiple jurisdictions. I think then there's more education globally about this space, and it starts to be easier to know which stable coins are not even stable coins, which projects are doing things the right way and which projects aren't and starting to weed those out. So, you know, there's definitely projects that I see where I think, you know, it's just a matter of time before someone wakes up and sort of realizes that that project may not be what, what the intention of the space is. Um, but I think that, you know, I think that the market likes likes the trusted regulated entities that are doing things the right way and have the right intentions in the product and so we'll just start to see more of that like education with regulators like leading to positive things yeah and i think um on the loan use case specifically i'll take it both from the loan provider and the loan recipient perspective so first from a provider perspective uh, i think the offer of crypto and blockchain is that you basically enable more transparency. So I actually was speaking to one microfinance institution that I will not name, but basically had a large fraud issue where their country manager embezzled like millions of dollars, right? And so it was millions of dollars that were taken away from people that should have access to those micro loans. So from a, um, a loan provider perspective, having that transparency is key, being able to like eliminate some of the, the costs associated with using fiat today, being able to transfer that into uh, better terms for the loan re um, recipients is key. And I think the other thing that we don't really talk a lot about is that digital identity is a big piece of what we're talking about when we talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency. So really being able to work with these populations to establish credit, to get access to credit, and to get to access in better terms, I think some of the promise of what we're seeing with cryptocurrency. All right, so thank you guys very much. Um, thank you, panelists. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I encourage you to, oops, wrong way. Um, thank you, KNL Gates and Stello for sponsoring. If you guys have any more questions for Stello, um, folks will be here to talk to you afterwards and um, in the future. And if you could join us online, we have a Telegram um, channel, uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, so if you want to see this or show this session to others afterwards, um, our Facebook Live will have a recording and we'll, we'll show that to everyone. And please let me know, please let me know if you have any topics you want to delve into in the next coming months. I'd love to talk about that and get a good group of speakers together just like we have tonight. So thank you guys, thank you all, and um, What? 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 What?
Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I know her. Yeah, pretty well. Cecilia is our like social queen. Yeah. No. <laughs> she knows everyone. No, I thought I'd introduce myself because I'm from Bolivia, right? Nice. Yeah. So, yes. I think I. Uh, oh, this is right before I start reviewing the US best documents. So. I think so. Yeah. Are they still recording? I feel uncomfortable. If <laughs> We're chatting here. I know. We're not saying anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's still recording though, so it's okay, better not me. Yeah. 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 There we go. Like uh, constructive breathing. Oh, oh, it's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You guys are too nice. We're checking the office. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Hi. Hi. Nice Jose. Jose. What's your name? Jose. Jose. Uh, Jose. Uh, Jose. Uh, Oh, nice! Yeah, yeah, John, Johnny. Oh, Johnny didn't make it today, but uh, nice. Which one? I, I, I met him right there. Right after, right after. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. One thing that I want to show you. I'm going to have time to get around here. I'm really, really sorry. Uh, yeah. What's fun? Uh, you know, it's that piece. It's a working Oh, yes, I know Starfish. You guys also host a lot of, like, uh, we did one on Wednesday. We invited someone yeah. from Office oh, going yeah. to Tuesday. Okay. Yes, yeah. 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 So you work at Starfish? Yeah, I collaborate. You know, it's, it's a decentralized, yeah, you know, the yeah. yeah. So yeah, I opened it uh, up. Okay. Uh, Starfish. Yeah. Starfish is doing a great job. Yeah. yeah. Every time I like, don't know, like, yeah. 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 No, but it's absolutely amazing. I know. It's a presentation and so on. Great. So, she's also at the start. Miranda. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I would highly recommend a shop called Jeans. Jeans? Oh my gosh. I've been wanting to check them out. Yes. I got working for glasses. Yeah. Try them out. Try them out. It's very trendy. I'm yeah. so tired of those. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you have to shop around. Yeah. They have like some own frames. Yeah. Yeah. Do you work in the Um, I work for Pokemon. Yeah. 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 So we have some like Pokemon folks here. We uh, we do crypto exchange. Oh, lovely. Yeah. 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 Nice. Together. Not together. Okay. I love to work for you. But we did. Probably like a stable coin exchange. I helped them design an onboarding flow. Their initial landing page. Okay. Also, like, just, they're like, their thing was just putting things from USD into stable coins. Also, they're making them. Okay. I started with stable coins to the system. Got to. It was more like an intro. Yeah. It was a really interesting like, project. So I got very nice. That's good. Yeah. What do you do now? Uh, I'm there to go. Also, legal counsel. Yeah. Got it. I'm supporting on the compliance side. Nice. Yeah. So, what do you do? Uh, what do you do for Starfish? I don't work at Starfish. Okay. Oh, have an office space. Oh, nice. We have our own. Yeah, right. Yeah. Starfish with yeah. PR. It's not PR. We do products in the US design. Okay. They're blockchain yeah. products. Okay. So we have like a really good two person team. We have a That's good. Yeah. I need. I haven't been to Starfish yet, but I should check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Nice to you. I'll let you know when it's a good event. Yes, please. But I think we have a good one. Okay. Who I need to talk? But okay, going to do a partner. Uh, this is a base in her wallet. Okay. Uh, Who I need think, to talk to? Do you think this is like an uh, uh, advertisement? Yeah, it would like a kind of That's what we need. All, you. oh, right here. Perfect. <laughs> No, I'm joking. You, you guys are fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but Lee is always watching our social media stuff. Uh, they want Lee. to do uh, advertisement on the on the uh, on, on the. So this is a new uh, hard wallet. 
Are you familiar with CQX? No. It's a new company. Uh, I'm representing them in the United States. I'm going to help them in Latin America, Spain as well. Basically, it's a really cool company. They are, they are producing right now three hard wallets with YouTube. So enable people to do three transactions without to be connected to internet. So right now I'm talking with Dash Venezuela to do the partnership. Uh, the idea is trying to talk with you, OK Coin, try to see how can we do a limited edition OK Coin wallet that we can partner up. And who is the right person? Give me a card. Oh yeah. So, um, we're always looking for new ways to promote. Yeah. So. I'm friend of Johnny. I was telling Miranda. Johnny is my friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was talking he to him. Yeah. I was talking to him the other day. Uh, I'll give you mine, but we don't have cards. I, I hate bringing cards. This is a really old card, and I don't know. No, no, that's fine. But my phone is there, and the email is there. Jose. Hello. Hello. Very nice meeting you. I think it's a beautiful design. It's beautiful. It, what I mean. It's total, it's total, Awesome. This is uh, 150 bucks. There is another, but uh, uh, which is really cool. First, the display has the QR code, so you can go with your phone. So it's kind of fix that tap solution. Yeah. Uh, touch screen. It's like the opposite to a Ledger Nano. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like uh, so yeah, really well, cool. The cool thing about these guys. They are launching, they are coming at the Bitcoin 2020 and they are launching the point of set. So they are doing the whole thing. Our wallets with Bluetooth, point of sale with Bluetooth, and the vending machine model that is coming up. So they, people can actually use stable in Venezuela, what we are going to do. So 1% of the stores in Caracas already they have. They are accepting crypto, which is crazy. They expect in two years it can go up to 10%. Burger King accept crypto. You can buy a burger in, in Caracas with crypto. Imagine, right? Like the adoption there because they need it. It's so totally survival. Uh, so we're trying to work out the deal, trying to. They don't have the money to pay for the so you send me an email, I send you an email, I, I bother you, yeah. Yeah. I send you all the information, yeah. the guys are coming next month. Great, and we'll be, we'll be there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, play around with him. Yeah, we'll be there. At, uh, oh, you have your yeah. Yeah, we're based here. Yeah. Actually, I invite uh, Jim. Yeah. There's my boss. So you are marketing department. Yeah. Last Tuesday, you had an event at the start. You were starting? Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, and I don't know what happened. Jim? Uh, that might have been the day he had, he was, oh, man. He had an accident. <laughs> He was on a well, I shouldn't laugh. He was on. He, he rides like a high rise, uh, not a scooter anymore, like a, one of the skateboards. Uh, one wheel. Uh, no, I think it's a two. It's got four wheels. Oh, the one wheel. Yeah, yeah. So that's my thing. I think he. Uh, I don't know, I'm like, I used to watch here today. So he's got his own scrape done. He's like, uh, he wears a lot of protection, so he's okay. Yeah. He was so, kind of yeah. out last week. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. He was a scripture and everything. Oh, yeah. 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 I was on vacation, I got back, and he's like, he's got stitches everywhere. He's got stitches on his teeth. He went through his clothes. Clothes, his clothes are all ripped up. Yeah. Okay. I'll show you, and then you sync it with your phone, and you don't need it. You don't break it. You just yeah, sync it with your phone. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Do you also work at OKCoin? Okay uh, yeah. Oh, you work at 
So hopefully I was, I'm, I'm trying to get something like this for you guys so we can wrap up. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of those like, have more details. So the app only works in iOS and Android. But like you can go to, so you can do, I'll show you the whole process. It's a, it's a, it's a class, not an app. It's an app, or you can actually go on the web. Oh, yeah. So, you can just scan the QR code and take you to the website, right? So that's the website here. You can see all the all the products they have. They recently received an award. The reason why I think they must be customers, even though I do not get wallets, I think around for a while I know how it's going to be different to sell wallets and more for promotion uh, the POS. This is the one that we got, which is the cool one with the aluminum. It almost looks like you want to have a beer and, and use it as a, as a coaster. This one is the same one, only a bit cheaper. That we can consider also the cheaper. Uh, it's exactly the same, it's just a little bit smaller, easier to go in your pocket. And then they have one without Bluetooth. Uh, this is the payment model that is coming out, and this is the app. But I'm going to show you how it goes without the app. Okay. How's the sale price? Yeah, it's American market is going to be 150 bucks. 120 for the smaller one and 110 for the one without Bluetooth. But I feel like the one without Bluetooth, I don't see the point anymore. It has to have Bluetooth. Yeah. So, I go to my wallet, right? iOS or web wallet. Now it's gonna, we are gonna sync it. So I'm enabling the Bluetooth, we are syncing it. We are pairing the devices, you give me a code. And boom, we are now seeing. They can customize tokens, it's an MCA training token, and then we take them. Get it in the system. And they are doing something really smart. I guess, like the chairman, the small guy, friend of the Taiwanese government. The second biggest city in Taiwan, the Taipei, I can't even pronounce it. Uh, they are launching this marketing campaign. They have to read this one. And many theories are brought to Taipei, they will see this one. So they are incentivized to go to the second, second biggest city to spend the money. And then that's where they are doing using the proper type of exactly. So they integrate that token by the Taiwanese, by the second biggest city in Taiwan. So people are actually using it in real cases at the museum, at the merchandise stores, in a very small scale. But I'll, I'll from Spain, tourism is so big in our city. I was writing the series, I was using the same point in the So, this is it's really cool. Yeah, let's keep in touch. I'll, I'll bother you guys. You have my card. I'll bother yeah. you guys a little bit. I just brought you uh, a little text or something. You have my card too. Uh, they are really ugly. That's why I don't even use them. But uh, oh, I think I will have them. Worry. But he has it. Miranda has it. I think I did too. Okay. Are you in charge of our? Really yeah. nice meeting you. Say hello to Jenny. All right. I will. Yeah. Absolutely.
You have your car with you, and then I can. Or uh, you know what? Let's hook up on. On LinkedIn. So you have a car. So you you are usually do you are you usually facing in Beijing as the yeah. office of Beijing? You are visiting. Yeah. All right. I send you a request later. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I send you a, and we are open. I have done my work. Oh oh. I just need to get it done. All right. I have it like the four of my movies. Okay. Or I can leave it all down, but I never think I had it. Oh, yeah. She had a like, uh, actually, actually, one of my friends might work on Oh, okay. Actually, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. It was so good. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really well, you know, we've got these amazing women. I know. I mean, it's like, it incredible. <laughs> Put them together, let them talk. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's my soul. I think it's my soul. Oh, all right. I'm leaving. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Oh.